Welcome to EFSA's e-learning on uncertainty analysis for chemical risk assessments. I'm Andy Hart and this is the first of three presentations in this course. In this presentation we introduce EFSA's guidance on uncertainty analysis and describe how to identify sources of uncertainty in a chemical risk assessment. What do we mean by uncertainty? In EFSA's guidance, uncertainty is used as a general term referring to all types of limitations in available knowledge that affect the range and probability of possible answers to an assessment question. This includes limitations in the relevance, reliability and consistency of evidence used in the assessment, which might include data, statistical estimates, modelling, qualitative evidence and expert judgment. These things are always uncertain to some degree and they matter because they lead to uncertainty in the conclusion of the risk assessment. So when is uncertainty analysis required? EFSA's scientific committee has said all EFSA's scientific assessments must include consideration of uncertainty. Specifically, assessments must say what sources of uncertainty have been identified and characterise their overall impact on the assessment conclusions. This is necessary because the uncertainty of scientific conclusions, the degree to which conclusions are certain or uncertain, has important implications for decision making. Risk managers may need some support and training on this. In addition, characterising scientific uncertainty is important for the transparency of EFSA's work. To address these needs, EFSA developed a guidance document on uncertainty analysis which was published in 2018. The guidance is supported by a much longer and more detailed opinion on the principles and methods for uncertainty analysis and by a separate guidance document on communication of uncertainty in scientific assessments. The guidance documents are written in general terms applicable to all areas of EFSA's work. So this e-learning course presents practical options for applying the guidance in chemical risk assessments. There are three presentations. First, this presentation, introducing key concepts from the guidance and describing methods to help you identify uncertainties in chemical risk assessments. In the second presentation, I will describe basic options for assessing the uncertainties you identify. And in the third presentation, refined options for assessing uncertainty. The key principle throughout is to tailor the uncertainty analysis to what is necessary and useful for each assessment. Of course, scientists are used to dealing with uncertainty and there are well-established approaches for this in chemical risk assessment. For example, uncertainty about the dose at which effects occur in animals is addressed by using no observed effect levels or the BMDL, the lower confidence limit for the benchmark dose. Uncertainty about differences in toxicity within and between species is addressed by the default uncertainty factor of 100. Some sources of uncertainty are addressed by conservative assumptions, such as assuming food additives are always used at maximum permitted levels. And some sources of uncertainty are addressed by alternative scenarios, for example, using lower and upper bounds for non-detects in occurrence data. For regulated products such as flavorings, food additives and pesticides, these approaches are generally used in a very standardized way, which is described in an official guidance document for a given class of regulated products. For example, the guidance document for smoke flavoring products, which was published by EFSA's FAF panel in 2021. Guidance documents specify the data to be submitted by applicants and how the assessment will be done, including standard elements such as those shown here for addressing the uncertainties that are normally present, the standard uncertainties. Assessments which follow the guidance are accepted by assessors and by decision makers as providing an appropriate basis for decision making because they are considered to provide adequate cover for these standard uncertainties. 
EFSA's uncertainty guidance recognises this and uses the term standardised procedure, defined as a procedure that specifies every step of assessment for a specified class of products or problems and is accepted by assessors and risk managers as providing an appropriate basis for decision making. So EFSA's uncertainty guidance uses the term standard uncertainties to refer to the uncertainties that are normally present and are addressed by a standard procedure. However, in some assessments, non-standard uncertainties are present. A non-standard uncertainty is any deviation from the standardised procedure that leads to uncertainty about the result of the assessment. This happens in some assessments of regulated products, for example, where there are limitations in the conduct or reporting of toxicity studies, doubts about the relevance or adversity of reported effects, or inadequate data on occurrence, processing effects, or metabolites. When non-standard uncertainties are present, they require additional approaches that go beyond standardised procedures. It's therefore essential to check, when using a standardised procedure, whether non-standard uncertainties are present. If no non-standard uncertainties are present, no further uncertainty analysis is required. This is part of applying the key principle of tailoring the uncertainty analysis to the needs of the assessment. When non-standard uncertainties are present, a case-specific assessment is required. An assessment where assessors develop a plan that is specific to the case in hand. Standardised elements, for example, default values, may be used for some parts of the assessment, but the non-standard uncertainties require case-specific approaches. So case-specific assessments often include many of the same standardised elements we've seen already, plus other case-specific elements which depend upon the needs of the assessment. For example, case-specific uncertainty factors such as when you're using a lowest observed adverse effect level instead of a NOL, case-specific assumptions or scenarios, modelling approaches, for example, toxicokinetic modelling or dose addition for mixtures, and expert judgment. Case-specific assessments are normally required for contaminants because there is no applicant and the available data differ from case to case ranging from substances with very little data to contaminants such as dioxins, for which there are extensive data in published literature. Case-specific assessments are also required in assessments of regulated products when non-standard uncertainties are present, where literature data are used, or when special assessments are needed, for example, in a mixture assessment. The specific methods needed for uncertainty analysis in a case-specific assessment depend on what types of uncertainties are present. So the first step is to identify the sources of uncertainty in your assessment. So identifying sources of uncertainty is an essential step every time you use a standardised procedure to determine whether non-standard uncertainties are present. And it's also essential in every case-specific assessment to identify the uncertainties that are present so you can plan how to address them in the assessment. So the next part of this presentation is about methods to help you identify sources of uncertainty. The uncertainty guidance recommends that you systematically examine all parts of every assessment to identify all sources of uncertainty that may affect your conclusion on the assessment question. The guidance distinguishes between uncertainties relating to assessment inputs and uncertainties relating to assessment methods. Both types must be taken into account, that is, anything that might contribute to making the conclusion uncertain. Uncertainties relating to assessment inputs include the relevance and reliability of data, data gaps and the applicability of assumptions. Uncertainties relating to assessment methods include any issues with modelling or statistical analysis, for example, poor fit or wide confidence intervals in benchmark dose analysis, 
and the methods used for literature search and expert judgment where these are involved. There are some tools that can help you to identify uncertainties. When using a standardised procedure, a list of the standard uncertainties that are addressed by it may help you to identify any non-standard uncertainties that are present. An example of such a list is included in the 2021 guidance for smoke flavourings. This shows the location of each uncertainty in the risk assessment, how it is treated in the standardised procedure and criteria for it to qualify as a standard uncertainty to help identify when the uncertainty becomes non-standard in a particular assessment. In both regulated and non-regulated areas, panels may find it helpful to develop lists of commonly occurring uncertainties. EFSA's CONTAM panel is developing one list for uncertainties in their exposure assessments and a second list for uncertainties in their hazard assessments. Sources of uncertainty are organised in groups with overarching questions and descriptions to help experts identify uncertainties in future assessments. Other panels might find these or similar lists helpful in their work. When using lists of this type, you also need to look out for additional uncertainties they don't cover to make sure you don't miss anything. More formal approaches, such as EFSA's critical appraisal tools, provide defined criteria which both identify and qualitatively evaluate sources of uncertainty affecting the evidence used in assessment. Here's an example from EFSA's 2019 opinion on setting dietary reference values for sodium, where they use colour coding to show the rating of different studies using the OHAT NTP critical appraisal tool. The criteria they used included randomization, blinding, reporting, and other threats to internal validity. Again, when using tools of this type, you need to look out for additional uncertainties they don't cover, in this case, uncertainties about the assessment methods. At minimum, if you don't use any of these tools, you should look for and list uncertainties affecting the assessment inputs and methods. EFSA's CONTAM panel has been doing this for many years, listing identified uncertainties in a table in every opinion. Here is an example from 2011. All of the uncertainties in this example relate to assessment inputs, and some also refer to methods used in the assessment, for example, the use of lower and upper bounds for non-detects in occurrence data. CONTAM also uses plus and minus symbols to indicate direction which uncertainties have the potential to cause overestimation or underestimation of exposure or risk. Recently, EFSA's SEP and FAF panels have also started including lists or tables of uncertainties affecting their assessments. Here is an example from the SEP panel's opinion on trypsin from porcine pancreas with separate lists for uncertainties affecting the assessment inputs and methods, and again, plus and minus symbols indicating the direction of impact. Finally, here is an example from the FAF panel's opinion on titanium dioxide, which summarises the uncertainties in a bullet list. At minimum, identified sources of uncertainty should be described in the text. However, Summarising them in a table or list like this is recommended for transparency. It's also very helpful for the experts when they assess overall uncertainty, another key step of uncertainty analysis which we will focus on in the next presentation. So, identifying sources of uncertainty is a key step when using a standardised procedure and in case-specific assessment. When using a standardised procedure, uncertainty analysis starts with checking for non-standard uncertainties. If none are found, you simply report that no non-standard uncertainties are present. No further uncertainty analysis is then needed and you can conclude the assessment in the normal way. If one or more non-standard uncertainties are found, you need to plan 
and implement an assessment of their impact and report the outcome appropriately. This conditional approach, depending on whether non-standard uncertainties are present, is part of tailoring the uncertainty analysis to what is necessary and useful for each assessment. In a case-specific assessment, you need to check for all types of uncertainties. There are always at least some uncertainties, so you always need to plan and implement an assessment of their impact and report the outcome appropriately. So in this presentation, I've introduced EFSA's definition of uncertainty and explained why at least some consideration of uncertainty is required in every assessment, at minimum to check whether non-standard uncertainties are present. Next, we record approaches that are already established for addressing uncertainty in chemical risk assessment, and I introduce the concepts of standardised elements and procedures which use these established approaches to address standard uncertainties that are normally present in chemical risk assessment, especially for regulated products. And case-specific assessments, which are needed when non-standard uncertainties are present and also generally for non-regulated chemicals. The second part of this presentation focused on identifying sources of uncertainty, an essential step in all types of assessment, described some simple tools that can help you with this, and showed examples of identified uncertainties from both regulatory and non-regulatory assessments. In presentations two and three, I will describe basic and refined options for assessing uncertainties so that when further uncertainty analysis is required in a regulatory or non-regulatory assessment, you can again tailor it to what is necessary and useful in each case.